dramatic results. And he gives a quote from another philosopher in that book. Um, he says, and this is from a person who is not a Vedantist. He says that the Upanishads are such a remarkable development in human civilization that I believe our dating system should not be AD and BC. It should be before Upanishad, after Upanishad. He finds it so powerful. And then he talks about the Mandukya Upanishad, the waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Now, let's take this in a few st uh, stages and see what insights we can get from uh, Vedanta, from Indian philosophy. Something that can keep the dialogue going. By the way, I am not going to promise and I don't see easy results coming. If easy results were coming, they would have come long ago. Uh, we are we are really investigating the ultimate subject and there's a play on words the subject itself consciousness which is you or i the interesting thing here is when you talk about something like black holes or super strings now these are so esoteric these are so super specialized that uh, only a few people with the requisite mathematics and advanced physics can authoritatively speak about it and we have to listen and try to understand as best and read Stephen Hawking's brief history of time and get some idea of that. But when it comes to consciousness, we are all experts. <laughs> because we, we are conscious. We have consciousness. We can always look inside into our own experience and check whether this guy is saying something useful or completely useless stuff. We can always check in our own experience. That's one of the beauties of, of uh, Advaita Vedanta. There's no doubt Advaita Vedanta is a part of religion, it's part of Hinduism. Advaita Vedanta is a part of, uh, of philosophy. Uh, so, but there is something unique about Advaita Vedanta. I want to mention that a little bit before we go into the, uh, this, this dialogue. Um, what's unique about Advaita Vedanta? And forgive me because I'm a little par um, partial, <laughs> partisan to Advaita Vedanta. Um, there is one way of uh, doing religion which is a faith-based approach. In, in fact, in the United States, the word for religion is faith. They'll ask you, what is your faith? In India, we don't do that because we know there are religions like Buddhism, which generally do not talk about faith in God. So, <clears throat> one approach is the faith-based approach. Well, the faith-based approach we are all familiar with. God exists. How do I know that? Well, you don't, but our, your holy scriptures tell you that, your tradition tells you that, um, you know, wise and holy men, mostly men, uh, they, they, uh, they tell you that. And so you're supposed to believe it. And yes, it works. If you have faith, if you uh, hold on to that and practice this devotional approach, faith-based approach, it works. But the problem is, I mean, there's no hiding it from an audience like this. You just have to listen to a debate with Christopher Hitchens or Richard Dawkins or you know Sam Harris, uh, something, the militant atheists. Faith-based approach cannot stand up to uh, a skeptical scrutiny. It doesn't even have to be a scientific scrutiny. It can just be a rational, skeptical scrutiny. If I simply challenge you, um, God said this, what God? No, where is your God? It is talk sense. So, God is in heaven. Where is heaven? No, where? If you push hard, people in religion will take a um, you know, back, back foot. They will say, no, it is symbolic. Okay, symbolic about what? If you keep pushing... There is no clear answer there. So, a, a skeptical inquiry, uh, something that starts with faith, uh, cannot withstand a direct skeptical attack. This has always been the problem. You notice in the uh, faith-based approaches, always there have been people who try to prove the existence of God. The famous theologian um, Thomas Aquinas, he offers in Christianity five proofs of the existence of God. Our own great logician, uh, Udayanacharya, the Nayaikas, they were engaged in trying to prove the existence of God because they were under, under attack from the Buddhists. So whenever you're trying to hold on to something by faith, it's always open to doubt, questioning. As against this, there's another approach. This faith-based approach is sort of common to religion all across the world. It is common to especially God-centered religions. But there are other approaches available in the Indian tradition and quite well known. The other approach is an experiential approach. Now remember, when I say experiential, 
um, experiential from your perspective or my perspective, not from a third person perspective. So, uh, when Sri Ramakrishna is having a vision of Mahakali, he is having quite openly in front of everybody. He is uh, seeing Mother Kali or talking to Mahakali. But remember, if you look at the description, he alone is seeing Kali, not anybody else. Others have to take it on faith until they have their own experience. But the beauty of this experiential path is it is open to everybody. Swami Vivekananda caught on this and in fact in the West, in America, he would say religion is realization. So um, if, I, if God exists, I should be able to see God. If I have an immortal soul, I should be able to feel it. See the language, an empirical language. Can I have experiences which justify the claims of faith? And the yogic path, the path of mystical experience claims that yes, you can do this. In fact, that's what turned Narendranath Dutta into Vivekananda. He goes to Sri Ramakrishna and asks, can I see, have you seen God? Can I see God also? And when Sri Ramakrishna says, yes, I have and you can too, that was enough for Narendranath to start investigating further and start following Sri Ramakrishna. So this is the path of experience. Again, problem is there. What is the problem? The problem is the people in this room Psychiatrist, neuroscientist, you know what they will say? They will say that I don't doubt that you feel you are experiencing God or feeling one with the universe. But actually what's going on is you have a little stroke on the brain here. Little, <laughs> little, little lesion is there. And there's a blood clot and that is making you feel like this. Are you actually seeing God? No, 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 no. You think you are seeing God. Are you actually one with the universe? No, 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 of course not. You are just a human being. Uh, and you, are, you feel you are one with the universe. That can happen. I mean, it's not just, you don't have to just have a um, stroke or a clot in the brain. Uh, I, in New York, recently they have legalized marijuana. So, every day when I go out of the ashram, after 6 p.m., so many spiritual experiences are going on all around. <laughs> so, the brain is affected by uh, substances ingested into the body and why not? The brain is part of the body. So if you ingest chemicals into the body, if something goes wrong in the brain, you will have uh, different kinds of experiences. And it's not just today. Mystics, those who claim to have extraordinary spiritual experiences, how have they been treated by society throughout the ages, in every religion, in every part of the world? What, did, what was the first reaction of most people? He's mad. <laughs> Crazy. So mystical experiences, though there are genuine mystical experiences, but first of all, they are rare. Not everybody has them. Even if you want them, it's possible for all of us to have it. But it takes long cultivated practice to get there. And even if you get there, it's good for you, not good for others. Good, not good means they will not accept it. Especially, um, um, you know, neuroscientists, psychiatrists, uh, uh, a skeptic yeah. will not accept. Because there's so much evidence that other things can also cause such experiences. And drugs can cause such experiences. Now, right now, that's a big thing again. In America, in waves, drugs come into fashion and go out. So now there, there are experiments going on with psilocybin. Uh, psil psilocybin, yeah. Um, okay. So what does Advaita have to say this, on this? We have, got, we have seen two, two different approaches to religion. One is the devotional approach, faith-based, which can easily be criticized. The other one is the experience approach. Not so easy to criticize, it's great because it makes an empir empirical claim. It can be experienced. But the experience itself is so specialized that again it can be an object of criticism, of at least skepticism. Advaita Vedanta has this remarkable advantage. This is, I think, a strong selling point. The, uh, the Advaita Vedanta approach is not faith. You're not supposed to believe in something. You're supposed to understand it. Understanding is the beginning. It's not the end of Advaita Vedanta. It's the beginning of Advaita Vedanta. And experience, yes. But what kind of experience? In Advaita Vedanta, we are not asking for extraordinary mystical experiences. We are asking for experiences which are normal, quotidian, day-to-day. -day. When you see Advaitic processes, the drashta and drishya, seer and the seen, 
it's our common experience now which is being talked about you are the experience that you are seeing and this is the objective world which you are experiencing and this is enough to begin the investigation of advait the advaitic investigation enough waking dreaming deep sleep who does not have it you don't need drugs to have waking dream you might if you don't get good sleep but in general waking dreaming deep sleep are available to everybody i was surprised to read a paper an ant ant has dreams how do you know ant has dreams how do you know so we have rapid eye movement during uh, our dreams so doctors can tell you that rem sleep ants have rapid antenna movement a ram sleep <laughs> ha huh? they they stop for a micro sleep and the uh, antenna move like this so the uh, the postulate is they might be dreaming <laughs> short sleep and short dream also so waking dreaming deep sleep we uh, all have these experiences and advaita says this is enough this is something really convincing and powerful in today's world you just this structure of experience subject object experience this is enough to start the advaitic investigation the uh, waking dreaming deep sleep this is enough to start the advaitic investigation vichara panchakosha the five levels with which we experience ourselves the physical body this one and there is the pranic body you know for the tip of which is the tip of the iceberg is the breathing the life forces within this body and then even deeper more inward so notice when in advaita when we say inward it does not mean physically in, in the body if you go physical in the body you find more body <laughs> but inward means in your direct first person experience you find thoughts emotions perceptions go further inward you find this faculty of understanding which is called buddhi or intellect which by which we are understanding these things go further inward you will hit a hit a blank wall nothing blank that is the ananda maya the causal body and that to which these five experiences of ourselves appears and disappears that is called consciousness and that is not an objective thing no this is all experiential all continuously available to everybody not just the mystic not just the yogi we all have it and on the basis of that if we conduct a rational inquiry we come to the uh, advaitic idea of consciousness so the first thing starts with the irreducibility of consciousness and mind to the brain so this is the hard problem of consciousness that you cannot um explain satisfactorily explain um, consciousness through brain processes um in fact there was a volume of papers on this called the irreducible mind a very interesting uh, papers although it shows some misunderstanding also there was one one paper called pure consciousness events pure consciousness events it is a paper of investigation you will say what's wrong with that from an advaitic perspective immediately you know there's a mistake there the just the title the moment you say pure consciousness events an event is something that begins and ends it is something that is observable that person is still thinking of something to be observed Uh, but whatever is observed is observed by consciousness in consciousness is presented to consciousness advaita vedanta agrees with the idea of pure consciousness but not pure consciousness events the moment you say event it's something to do with the mind or the body so these are in- insights which one can uh, always share fruitfully with uh, you know in a dialogue between neuroscientists psychiatrists philosophers i remember one such dialogue in the institute of culture dr ravindra was present um and in one 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 interaction there was a neuroscientist and there was a professor of philosophy of sankhya philosophy um dr professor larson an american and there was no progress the neuroscientists and the doctors were saying one thing physicists and the philosophers were saying another thing and there's no way of mapping so finally this professor larson he asked the neuroscientist doctor how do you is there consciousness in deep sleep at that time the idea was there's no consciousness in deep sleep so he said no consciousness there's no consciousness in deep sleep the way we define it there's no consciousness in deep sleep and professor larson said here is the difference according to indian philosophy at least sankhya and advaita there is only consciousness in deep sleep <laughs> so this is the gulf so deep sleep there is nothing to be observed there's no objective presentation that's why a blankness and the blankness is presented to consciousness that's the that accounts for deep sleep in an advaitic perspective one uh, professor 
um, uh, Galen Strossen, he wrote a half humorous piece, semi humorous piece in the New York Times, Hard Problem of Matter. But he, it was very perceptive. What he said was, this, all this discussion about hard problem of consciousness is misplaced. Why? We are all conscious. Who is here not conscious here? All the readers of New York Times are conscious. <laughs> Otherwise, how can you read? So consciousness is directly experienced by each of us, directly. It is matter which is presented to consciousness. It is the object which appears to consciousness. When we say subject and object, they are not equal. You are a subject and to you objects appear. So matter appears to consciousness. We have somehow made up our mind that matter is producing consciousness. Now we cannot explain how matter is producing consciousness, hence hard problem of consciousness. But why are you beginning by assuming that matter is producing consciousness? There is good reason, because materialist uh, explanations are predominant in the world of science today. So that's why this, uh, we are trying to explain in terms of matter. But he says, rather, it is matter which is a mystery. I am conscious, and then I am experiencing something. What is that thing? That's the question. And, when we, and then he says, when physics investigates matter, before our very eyes, matter is disappearing. From atoms to subatomic particles to um, um, quarks to now superstrings, what they are talking about. So it's becoming more and more esoteric. It's becoming mathematics now. You mentioned the talk on it from bit from jet. Actually, it just sort of came up as a half humorous remark with um, Professor Chalmers. Um, you know, he talks about there's a theory of how uh, matter is nothing but information. Now, information is analogous to mind in Vedanta. So mind is also nothing but consciousness. So consciousness appears as mind and matter. And then we thought, oh, all right, it from bit from chit sounds like a great uh, topic for a talk. And I actually gave that talk later on. <laughs> um, there are some, like Professor Chalmers and a few others, uh, Bernardo Karstrup, uh, Donald Hoffman, who are open to this idea that consciousness may be a fundamental reality not something that is emergent from material processes in the, in the brain. Um, if you cannot explain in terms of more fundamental realities, then you have to say that the phenomenon you are investigating is a fundamental reality itself. So this, this is what is now called, or it was called, panpsychism. It is an old theory that consciousness is pervading, actually mind is pervading the universe, that was the idea. Uh, it has now been revived and pretty eminent people are sort of beginning to advocate it. Uh, like um, David Chalmers himself, in one of the interviews, he said, uh, look, if you think long and hard about the hard problem of consciousness, only two things are possible. Either you will become a panpsychist, that is consciousness is everywhere, or you will become an administrator. <laughs> you will give up research and go to administration. So this is, this is one important thing, where Vedanta uh, would completely agree that consciousness and mind are not reducible to physical processes. Then what is consciousness? Here is something that is not yet. So this is something that is being discussed now. This is open on the table now. That it's possible that consciousness may not be reducible to uh, physical processes. Possible that consciousness may be uh, a fundamental process of the, of the universe. Um, fundamental reality of the universe. But one more powerful insight from Advaita. Uh, from Sankhya, uh, it is not yet part of the worldwide discourse, which is something that we can take up here in India. Uh, outside, I've seen, I've suggested this at Harvard University in the philosophy department also. They consider it interesting, but they find it a little difficult to grasp this idea. The idea is, mind and consciousness are not the same thing. This is, uh, in most of the literature in the world you'll find, the modern literature, in the philosophy of mind, in consciousness studies, they treat consciousness as mind as the same thing. If you ask, in consciousness studies, what are you studying? They will say, we are studying perception, we are studying emotion, we are studying cognition. Vedanta will say, all of these are mind, or more precisely, they are mixtures of mind and consciousness. How will you distinguish between mind and consciousness? Very elegant analytical knife is there to distinguish between consciousness and mind. I used it a little while ago. One of Shankara's disciples, Padma Pada Acharya, more than 1400 years ago, he says, Anidam Chaitanyam, not this consciousness. Idam, this. Not this consciousness. Whatever can be designated as this is not consciousness. This table, not consciousness. This shirt, not consciousness. 
this body this not consciousness very interesting this mind this thought this memory this ego this this ego i feel i right now i'm feeling it i can call it this ego it can be designated as this this uh, perception this emotion this 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 therefore not consciousness quite remarkable when you when you look at it this way is it theoretical is it something weird no it's how we are experiencing right now if you are experiencing a thought you can call it this thought this thought in my mind this thought is troubling me so this thought it's an object whatever is presented to consciousness is an object to consciousness is not consciousness the mind is presented to consciousness just like you are aware of the body you are aware of the mind too when when shankara's disciple in upadesha sahasri asks that you are saying that this is an object and the body is also an object i i have an objection to this what is the objection <laughs> is that if i hit this i have no problem but if someone hits me he actually says if someone burns my skin it hurts it hurts how can i say this is an object i feel the pain then shankara says ah do you feel it of course if you feel it is it an object or not even the pain is an object even the pain is an object and if you think in this way i have tried it and you can easily try it it's a nice exercise psychologically you begin to relax even in the presence of pain if you treat the pain as an object i was giving this talk once a teenager in the audience in america he was pinching himself somebody asked him what are you doing so i'm trying out what he is saying <laughs> and observing it as an object yes and it actually works so even mind sensations are objects they're not consciousness beyond this lies two more fundamental steps very big and very radical completely not acceptable by modern science at this point but i just throw it out there just to complete the uh, talk the two more insights one is that it's one consciousness i think it's heisenberg who said consciousness is the uh, consciousness is the phenom- is that which has no is a si- schrodinger the singular which has no plural and he was right advaita vedanta insists it's one consciousness not many many bodies you can count the bodies here many minds also but consciousness how would you say apart from body and mind how would you say consciousness is many so advaita vedanta says consciousness is one in bhagavad gita chapter 13 second verse sri krishna says to arjuna kshetragyam chapi mam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharata he says in all these bodies and minds there is one consciousness i am